In America's century-long romance with the automobile, the passion has never burned brighter than with hot rods. Be they immaculate show cars, gritty racers, or somewhere in between, hot rods embody the core values that made this country great. Innovation, competition, improvisation, good looks, fast cars, and the relentless drive to succeed. As told by the legends, old and new, who lived it. This is the incredible true story of an American icon, the Hot Rod. Hello, I'm Chip Foose. Before the age of the automobile, man could only go as fast as his legs or his horse could carry him. Early mass-produced cars would have difficulty keeping up on a modern freeway. But in a remote corner of Utah in the 1950s, hot rodders were pushing their home-built creations to over half of the speed of sound itself in pursuit of an elusive international record. The dry lake beds of Southern California were the original speed zone for hot rodders. But the alkali dust kicked up by tires and the wind became a problem, as did the degradation of the lake beds themselves due to lakes racing's unprecedented popularity in the late 1940s. As speeds rose over 150 miles per hour, hot rodding was in the process of outgrowing its ancestral home. What was needed was a new venue, a larger one that would allow for longer runs with a better surface that wouldn't cause engines to foul with dust. The problem is that dry, flat, miles long surfaces don't just grow on trees. Thankfully, such a place was already waiting for hot rodders and their increasingly dynamic cars. 15,000 years ago, a massive salt lake covered most of northwestern Utah. But catastrophic drainage left behind 5 million tons of salt spread out over 3,000 square miles. Discovered by U.S. Army Captain Benjamin Bonneville in the 1830s, the Bonneville Salt Flats had already come into service as a high-speed playground. Nature gave us a gift for high-speed runs, which was the Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah. Early on, way back in the 20s and 30s, uh, Sir Malcolm Campbell and some other folks did high-speed racing there to try to set world land speed records. All of a sudden, Bonneville Speed Week became the place. The cars that went first to went four or five and 600 miles an hour, all were done in Bonneville. And all were done, by the way, by hot rodders. But they're all American hot rodders, and you had them going out to the salt flats because they needed the space to run at those speeds in safety. There were many guys after the war that, that started out the dry lakes that really became legends when Bonneville started. Bonneville was such a unique place to run and so famous in speed records. Anybody that ran at Bonneville and set a record, they were in Hot Rod Magazine, and they were noted as being really fast and their cars were beautiful. The unstated goal, preposterous as it seemed at the outset, was breaking the one-way world land speed record of 403.135 miles per hour, set by Sir John Cobb in 1947. But he was working from a very different set of circumstances than the average hot rodder. The English guys that did it, like Sir Malcolm Campbell or John Cobb, I mean, they typically had lots of money or they had lots of backing. You know, it was a rich man's sport but they were always kind of expensive, factory-backed operations. Well, America's different from that. We, we got Model Ts and we got backyard mechanics, and those guys figured out how to do it. I mean, you look at Alex Exidius's Streamliner, which was one of the first cars to go 200 miles an hour. It was a Model T frame, you know, with a V8 engine stuck back in. I mean, it was pure hot rod ingenuity. As with so many milestones in hot rod history, the move to Bonneville was the brainchild of Wally Parks. Seen here with SCTA president Ack Miller and Hot Rod Magazine founder Robert E. Peterson. The very first Bonneville Speed Week in August of 1949 was organized by the Southern California Timing Association, whose members had the same passion for safety and regulation at Bonneville as they'd shown on the dry lakes. They brought a lot of the same gear too.
One of the first race teams to make an impact to Bonneville was SoCal Speed Shop, coming off an impressive 1948 racing season on the dry lakes. Alex Exidius and his team arrived at the first Bonneville Speed Week with a car that would push hot rodding into the space age. Our streamliner, which was the next step from the belly tank, was something that had not been successful in hot rodding before. I think there had been one effort. And because it did not go fast, for various reasons, nothing to do with the body, people dropped it. They thought that the open wheel car with little tires was the way to go. And uh, thanks to Dean Batchelor, who was one of my first customers and then became my good friend, thanks to his interest outside of hot rodding, he later became the editor of Road and Track and wrote Porsche magazines and Porsche books and Ferrari, became an expert in everything. Dean Batchelor spent the end of World War II in a Nazi POW camp. So it was ironic that when he designed the exterior of the Streamliner, he took inspiration from a pre-war German race team. Unlike SoCal Speed Shop, who had to build on a budget, the powerful government-backed auto union team had all the money they needed for advanced wind tunnel testing of their aerodynamic surfaces. He had read a book by Auto Union, pre-war, the 219 speed car. They enclosed the Grand Prix car with a streamlined body and they in increased their speed dramatically. And the, the thing I remember most, Dean showed me the paragraph, by enclosing the wheels with a, an envelope body, they increased the front area of the car 50%. They made it bigger, but they decreased the aerodynamics by 50%. It was bigger, but it's slicker. When I read that, I mean, it was a remarkable thing. So Dean and I built the SoCal Streamliner, fully enclosed car, and we're incredibly successful with it. Even the most aerodynamic exterior is so much scrap metal without an engine. So Alex turned to a trusted friend, the most famed lakes racer and speed equipment manufacturer of the era, Vic Edelbrock Sr. So I, that's when I went to Vic and I said, you know, how about a bigger motor that we can go faster in this thing? Well, Dean, <laughs> Dean thought he was going to maybe go 140 in this in the streamliner and now all of a sudden I'm telling you yeah, we're going to put this big motor in there and we're going to go faster than that how fast were we going to go of course we had no idea we didn't have wind tunnel tests we didn't know if we were really going to be more efficient but we thought we would be and we were all stunned like everybody else I mean it was amazing we raised the hot rod record from 160 which was a belly tank to 193 the first year 33 miles an hour jump at one time that the hot rod record had been going up a mile an hour at a time until then. So we proved a, a very valuable concept. The next year we improved a few things and went 210 and Ken's and Leslie showed up with a fully enclosed car. They went 210. The next year Streamliners became the big success of Bonneville and as I said earlier they hold all the international records now. The SoCal Dreamliner beat Bill Cans and Roy Leslie because it was so aerodynamic it was trying to fly. Dean Batchelor was way ahead of Matt with, along with Alex helping him. Dean was this incredible, knowledgeable guy. And uh, he was a perfectionist. And uh, he was a nitpicker and uh, a, really, a really good friend. He was a veteran B-17 guy that got shot down. and. Came home, first thing he did, bought a 32 Roadster. Second thing he did is he came by SoCal Speed Shop. Third thing he did is buy something from me. And then we became good friends. And basically, he was an input on all kinds of things because he was so smart. In the early days of hot rodding, we had no respect for somebody that was racing an MG. We just, they were rounding, and, they were, and we were going down the salt flats. Sadly, the Streamliner was destroyed beyond repair in a crash at Daytona Speed Week in 1951 in pursuit of the international Class C speed record. But the lesson had been learned, and streamlining became all the rage. Hot rodders, these were guys who really, maybe they had a little aircraft experience. They didn't know a lot about streamlining per se, but they, they did understand that if a car were streamlined enough and light enough, 
incredible speeds could be attained. I mean, you saw that with belly tanks, and then they realized you've got to fare those wheels in. Uh, the whole car has to be kind of an, an, an airfoil, but like a negative airfoil, so it's not going to take off. I mean, Alex Exidius and Dean Batchelor learned that the hard way with the SoCal Streamliner because the car literally came up, rolled over. But these guys were knocking on the door of 200 miles an hour and 200 plus, and uh, it didn't take long before they got there. Innovation at Bonneville didn't stop with streamlining, as the 50s was a time of creative experimentation. In any extreme environment, evolution could lead to an almost bizarre level of specialization. The Bonneville salt flats were no different, as the constant pursuit of speed bred some pretty strange looking cars. Even traditional cars took on rather odd looks on the salt flats. In fact, coupes, having been raced on the dry lake beds under the auspices of the Rosetta Tiny Association, found new life at Bonneville. Chopped, streamlined, outfitted with racing noses and blown engines, these coupes brought a touch of the old days to the salt flats, with enough of the new to remind everyone that Bonneville was serious business. Three such coupes stood above the rest. While old school hot rods like Roadsters and Belly Tanks performed admirably at Bonneville, some of the highest profile cars to race on the salt flats were coupes. One of the finest and most influential was a Chop 34 belonging to brothers Bob and Dick Pearson. Pearson was working for my dad and they decided to do this coupe and it was actually done in Bobby's garage. And the rule was seven inch windshield. Well, they were thinking of seven inch windshield straight up and nobody said about what the angle had to be. And so they just absolutely laid that thing way, way down. And when they, when they saw it, they said, oh my God, seven inch, it's got a seven inch windshield. That car was very slick. In fact, it didn't use a lot of nitro, but it ran fast without it because it was a real aerodynamic car. It really worked good for them. And it was a car that, you know, the Pearsons were noted for. It was the first coupe to do 150 miles an hour. So this was like huge. And Dan Gurney, when we unveiled the car, said this coupe was like seeing something land from outer space because back in the 40s and 50s, most of the cars were primer and kind of cobbled together and things were pop riveted on. This car was like a flare going off in a field of, of pretty rough cars. It was turned out. It had candy apple paint. The Pearson brothers really dialed this car in. I mean, it is movie star good looks then and today. It is just one of those cars that just worked. Alex Exidius followed up the Streamliner with the SoCal Coupe, another 34, which took many of its design cues from the work of the Pearson brothers. We needed to do more than just go to Bonneville with the Streamliner. So something that we could race at the drags and race at the dry lakes both. I had always had 34s, a 34 coupe. I really liked those things. So that became the car. And there was a great deal of influence, no question, on me with the Pearson coupe because a Chop 34 really looked good. So that's what we decided to build, a Chop 34 coupe with a racing nose on it and do it as beautifully as we could. We never did run against Pearson because we were running a different engine class and everything, and, and he was beginning to, to not run anymore. At Bonneville, it was the Chrisman Coupe, which was the king of the competition coupes in those days. Art Chrisman, who had become primarily known for his drag racing prowess, was a top competitor at Bonneville before ever achieving renown in the quarter mile. His first trip to Bonneville in Chet Herbert's Beast 3 Streamliner earned him one of five inaugural slots in the 200 mile per hour club. In 1953, he returned with his own car, the third legendary coupe to grace the salt flats. Unlike the SoCal and Pearson coupes, the Chrisman coupe was originally a Model A. That was another car that, that was suitable for, for Bonneville. And that's why Art got into drag racing himself with a different car. He couldn't run the the coupe at the drags. 
We went to Bonneville with a 34 coupe with a flathead in it. We must have made three, four runs a day trying to break the record. We couldn't break the record. So we took the engine out of the car one night, and had the engine all apart, overhauled the engine right there, and I was hooked. I was hooked on Bonneville. So I got to have a car. These three coupes, SoCal, Chrisman, and Pearson Brothers, would do battle on a very different stage half a century later on a golf course in Monterey, California in the prestigious Pebble Beach Concord d'Elegance. The top speed at the 1950 Bonneville Speed Week was 210 miles per hour. A decade later, a jack of all trades named Mickey Thompson was preparing to not only double that record, not only become the fastest American in history, but to break Sir John Cobb's 403 mile per hour land speed record. Uh, some of the early cars, you know, like the Chet Herbert Streamliner, the SoCal Streamliner, I mean, these cars fairly quickly got up into the low 200 range. And uh, speeds inched up fairly progressively. I mean, it's almost like each year at Bonneville, people found a way to go faster. These streamliners were certainly uh, approaching 300 and even more. And Mickey Thompson, you know, one of the absolute heroes of the whole picture because Mickey could do sports cars, he could do Indy cars, he certainly could do hot rods. And right from the beginning, so he was always looking for ways to go fast. If it could be raced, then Mickey Thompson raced it, and probably won with it. Mickey set more speed and endurance records than any man who ever lived. He was also a Bonneville veteran, having run on the salt flats for almost a decade before attempting his land speed record run. His first Bonneville car was this competition coupe. More influential was his 1958 run at the salt flats. There was a four-wheel drive car that ran at Lions Drag Strip. Mickey bought that car and he put two Chryslers in there. They had built a streamlined body on it. They were going back to the Nationals to race and try and win the Nationals. But they decided that we'll, we'll hit Bonneville on the way and we'll run it up there. By golly, they went about 270 miles an hour with that car and it was sensational. So they came home. And I understand that's when Mickey got the idea, maybe I could go over 400 miles an hour with a four-engine car. And I've heard that he drew the general idea of this four-engine car with chalk on the garage floor. Well, it was a very good design. One of the greatest stories about uh, Mickey Thompson's four-engine challenger, Donald Campbell asked him for the blueprints. He goes, there ain't any blueprints. We made it on the floor of a garage in El Monte, you know, with milk crates and string and glue and bits of wood. You know, we just built it because that was how they did it. And that's, that's the goosebumpy bit of the whole thing. You've got this hot rod ingenuity going up against the might of Germany or big old money from England, proving that you can be just as clever, just as fast. And that's the bit that translates to the guy on the street. You know, he doesn't have to be Mickey Thompson to drive a hot rod. He can build a hot rod out of, you know, an old Model A or a 32 and be as cool. The Challenger won a 7,000-pound, 2,000-horsepower behemoth sporting four massive supercharged Pontiac engines was the result of Mickey's garage engineering. And the car, if such an advanced machine could ever be called a mere car, made an impression just sitting on a trailer. Mickey was certainly a huge hero. I begged my dad to take me to Lions Drag Strip in 1959 because they were going to have a first showing of the Challenger. They paraded it up and down the track on the trailer. And it was like seeing a rocket ship. I mean, I couldn't conceive of anything like that. You know, that you could build a car in your garage that's going to go 400 miles an hour. In an early shakedown run in August 1960, Mickey got the Challenger 1 up to 354 miles per hour, putting the international land speed record within reach. One month later, on September 9th, Mickey broke John Cobb's one-way record with a run of 406.60 miles per hour. A mechanical fault on his return run prevented Mickey from claiming the official two-way record. But the dragon had been slain. An American, and even better, a hot rodder from California, was the fastest earthbound human being who'd ever lived. On that day, Mickey Thompson became a hero to hot rodders around the world. Mickey was not only the, the visionary who saw a way to put four ultimately supercharged Pontiac engines in this uh, streamliner and 
drive it from a position so far back that you had probably no idea where the front was, basically lying almost halfway backward like this, trying to focus on a black line of oil and ultimately going over 400 miles an hour. I mean, cojones, you know, <laughs> grandes. <laughs> Incredible that somebody could do that. And Mickey was kind of one of us. So we felt we were part of this kinship of guys who um, didn't care what the factories were doing, didn't care what the great race people in Europe were doing. Um, I mean, Mickey went as quickly as John Cobb, you know, a Brit Britain's government underwritten effort with aircraft engines and all that sort of thing. And here was a California guy with a four-engine car that, uh, that went 400 miles an hour. Mickey just lived in the fast lane in the best fashion. I mean, he was gutsy, smart, cool-looking, everything that is exciting about the car hobby. I love his four engine Challenger. The notion that he got in that car and went 400 miles an hour plus. I don't think there are very many guys on this earth that could put that car together and drive it that fast. Mickey Thompson and the hundreds like him who ran at Bonneville proved that you don't need bundles of cash to design and create a record breaking car. Just ingenuity and creativity. They embodied the hot rod ideal that it's better to build than to buy. And their legacy lives on to this day on the salt flats where improvised cars still hold a place of honor. I'm Chip Foos. Thanks for watching. Next time on American Icon, the hot rod. There's no sense in putting all that work into an engine that can make your car go fast, but not let anybody look at it. So with these orders pouring in, then Edelbrock started complaining that we don't have enough time to pump gas. And Peterson said, well, maybe it's time you realize that you're not a gas station anymore. He says, well, I'm taking off the fuel injection and putting on the carburetors. Oh, no. If that's what makes it go, that's what we're going to run.